Well, the future is indeed electric. As we dive into episode number 42 of Canada Talks Electric Cars. A shout out to the regular viewers joining us today and a warm welcome to all of our first time viewers. If you're not already a full member of EV Society, please consider joining at evsociety.ca. Grave concern over the climate crisis and air quality as well have led many to conclude that electrifying all forms of transportation is essential. There are change, changes coming to the way we move people and goods that will be rather profound. This is the basis for today's episode of the webinar. If you have any questions over the next hour, please submit them using the Zoom Q&A button and don't hesitate to give a thumbs up to questions others have posted if they're also of interest to you. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Michael Bernard joining us today to talk about the radical electrification of transportation. Michael spends his time projecting scenarios for decarbonization 40 to sometimes 80 years into the future. He assists executives, boards, and investors to make sound choices for the future, whether it's refueling aviation, grid storage, vehicle to grid, or hydrogen demand. His work is based on the fundamentals of physics, economics and human nature, and informed by the decarbonization requirements and innovations of multiple domains. Michael's leadership positions in North America, Asia, and Latin America enhance his global point of view. He publishes regularly in multiple outlets on innovation, business, technology, and policy. Hey, Michael, welcome to the webinar. Yeah. So I am going to uh, turn everything over to you and I'm going to get out of the way and you can just have at it. Excellent. Thank you again. And uh, here we go. Okay. When we say radical, it is pretty radical. Um, this is a, a chart that I developed a while ago. Um, sexy versus man, practical versus foolish quadrants. Uh, basically, it's a way of grouping purported solutions into useful and non-useful typed and you know, pedestrian, but it, high, high practicality solutions. And so kind of like, look around there, you can just see the high speed rail, electric cars and pickups get a lot of attention. Then there's a bunch of stuff that gets attention like hydrogen fuel cell cars and trucks and trains and maglev trains that gets a lot of attention, but doesn't deserve it. Then there's stuff that's, you know, like pipelines that are pretty much going to go away, uh, you know, over 5 uh, million kilometers of pipelines in the USA. And if we had to actually do carbon capture and sequestration at any scale, we'd have to triple the number, quadruple the number of pipelines around the world. Kind of silly. Um, and then there's the stuff that's going to be pretty practical that most people don't pay a lot of attention to. Battery trucks, trains, electric bikes, you know, tiny EVs, changes to the streets so that, you know, there's bike lanes and stuff like that, and a lot of transit. So that's kind of the ground transportation, but the big thing to take away here is it's all going to be electric, every single last bit of it. There isn't going to be any domain of ground transportation that's burning fuel, except for recidivists in their old muscle cars who are buying fuel from somebody and going to the drag strip because they just can't resist, you know, and they'll die off eventually. So let's take a couple of examples because it's kind of fun. So here's rail. Now, we live in North America for the most part, and we've got this weird outlier thing where we don't electrify our rail. But look at India, and I'll just highlight it down here. Um, they're at 85% electrified, and they're aiming for 100% electrified heavy rail by 2025. Uh, that's because it makes sense. China, 72% electrified. Um, you know, Morocco's got high speed rail, 60% electrified in Europe, and you know, here's an example, bit evocative. The Trans-Siberian Railroad is electrified over its entire 9,300 kilometer route. One of the first railroads that was ever built was electric. This is known technology. It's not hard. It's the future for decarbonized rail. Only in North America and South America do we not get this yet. And we will because as we electrify road freight with uh, electric semi-trucks, <clears throat> well, they're going to be cheaper to operate than rail. So more stuff will shift over to rail. And in North America, we've got 4 million cars of coal a year and 70,000 cars of oil a year. That's all going away. So, you know, rail is going to diminish. It's going to get, there's going to be bankruptcies. Then eventually 
the current weird um, rail system in North America where the rails are privately owned will go away. The government will step in. We'll get some stuff fixed and we'll catch up with the rest of the world. Now, this is a heavy mining uh, thing. This is like one of those big Tonka toy trucks where if, if there was a human being here, you'd see them standing with their head around the axle. Uh, you can see that with the you know, big ladder that uh, you know is there in the front to get people up to the front. Um, so why do, why do I have this here? Well, uh, this year we had this interesting announcement from various mining majors. So BHP, one of the biggest ones in the world, Rio Tinto, another huge one, Fortescu, smaller, but still global and big. Um, they all announced separately that they'd done their assessments of uh, what they would do for decarbonizing their massive mining trucks and all the equipment at mines. And they said, we're just gonna use electricity. We're not gonna use hydrogen, that's far too inefficient, You know, three times the cost, we're not gonna bother. So mining, it is probably the ultimate massive off-road uh, situation, the most demanding situation. And they basically said, no, we're just going to use batteries and some grid ties and some stationary charging and some dynamic charging, and that will work just fine. Uh, similarly, many of you probably haven't seen one of these in action. This is a uh, uh, one of the basically a forklift for containers uh, that they use in the ports. I've seen one of these zip around in a uh, CN rail uh, transshipment port in Montreal when they were my client a few years ago. They can lift up to 16 meter long containers wearing, weighing up to 40 metric tons and buzz them around and stack them. Um, quite amazing to watch. Um, and the reason I've got these up now is that Maersk, the major shipping company, although their terminal management, their port management firm, uh, APM, uh, AP Muller Terminals, uh, just released a white paper about how they're gonna decarbonize all of those things. There's a, a little over 800 ports globally. There's about 100 to 120,000 of uh, vehicles like this one and some other ones like tractors and stuff in ports. And they emit about 15 to 20 million tons of CO2 a year, 10 to 15 million tons of CO2 a year. And was it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be synthetic fuels? Is it going to be buff? No, it's going to be batteries. It's going to be battery electric. All the cranes, those huge cranes and container ports, or almost all battery electric already. Everything that's tethered, like the gantries and the, that carry the uh, um, containers around and the big cranes, those are already electric. They just plug into the grid, but it's gonna be batteries for the rest of this stuff. It's just a matter of doing the work. Um, so that's ground transportation. It, it's all electric. The hardest stuff to do, we're gonna do it. We just had the big bake off for uh, trucks and something like 90% of truck of road trucking um, can now be met with current um, battery electric trucks. So there's not gonna be anything there, but then that leaves other questions. What about shipping on the water? Another big place is called, referred to as hard to decarbonize. So one of the things that I did a couple of years ago was I figured out how much of everything there was in a single unified data set because they tend to have data sets that are segregated in different ways and i pushed it all together normalized all the units it was very nerdy um and basically this is what it looks like from 1990 over here we saw a massive increase in shipping um in megatons of freight um and there's some interesting things about that so you'll notice oh i'm asserting that as we move forward the number of ton, megatons of freight that we ship are going to go down. The reason for that is that 40% of bulk shipping is coal, oil, and natural gas. And we're going to stop doing that for the most part. We're going to still be extracting some hydrocarbons for petrochemicals that we don't burn for durable plastic products and some industrial feedstocks. But we're going to be extracting perhaps 10% of the oil we extract today. We're going to replace some of the biomass feedstocks, and we're generally not going to be shipping nearly as much fossil fuels. Um, I've got some stats on how much, how absurd the scale of that is uh, later on. Now, raw iron ore, um, same thing. It's 15% of bulks. And because most of that was shipped to the same place coal was going, so most of that is actually going to be processed a bit more locally with green hydrogen, about 55 kilograms per ton of steel 
or with biomethane instead of natural gas and direct reduction of iron stuff. But mostly we'll be doing processing of iron ore into iron closer to the mine because we need electricity and that's easier to get than uh, coal. So container shipping will go up, but not as much because fuel costs as we decarbonize are gonna go up for tr cross transoceanic stuff. And so there's going to be a readjustment. It's gonna be a downward pressure on freight shipping. And that's gonna lead to some more local stuff and some more other stuff. But we're also gonna get to the point in the later half of the century where we're seeing uh, flat population growth. It's one of the big things in my projections is you know, the uh, UN projections are um, still for 2100 for peak population, but they're very credible modern demographic projections that use more factors, which are saying peak population is going to be 2050 to 2070, which is great. We're going to avoid that final Malthusian meltdown, I think. So that's good news. So what does that mean? Well, um, this is by category, deep water, Short sea and inland. Deep water means crossing oceans. Short sea means going between countries across seas, but close, like in Northern Europe or from uh, Cuba to um, Cuba to Miami, if that was allowed. Uh, so short sea shipping, and then there's inland shipping, the Mississippi, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, the Rhine. So let's talk about that. So different categories for those, obviously, on a river or great on the Great Lakes. Uh, all that's going to be electric. Um, we actually have a one um, a 700 container ship um, that is got, running on battery electric now uh, on the Yangtze River in China. And the sister ship is also launched now, I believe. It's running a thousand kilometer route with batteries. Now, the way they do that is they have the batteries in containers and they have 36 containers of batteries, a couple of megawatt hours per container. And they just dock them up and down and when they get to a port, they winch off a depleted battery and they winch on a new battery and plug it in and away they go. Since we already plug in ref refrigeration containers in ships and in ports, this is just more of the same. So very easy to use. China actually has uh, does 50% of the world's um, inland shipping, unsurprisingly, big rivers. And they've got a commitment to decarbonize all of it. And that's going to be electric. Um, then we get to short sea, two thirds of short sea shipping, you know, all the stuff in Northern Europe, uh, for example, will decarbonize. Uh, is one of the things that we talk about in this context is well, battery energy density. And so um, right now, the battery energy density of a common, uh, you know, common maritime solution is about 40 nautical miles. Well, Tesla's batteries are double that, so 80 nautical miles and the CATL, C-A-T-L, the biggest EV battery manufacturer in the world, just announced more of that. So double again, and then quintuple. The end state is about 1,200 nautical miles, which I think is around 1,800 kilometers or something like that. Uh, some sailor will correct me in the comments, I'm sure. Um, but when I was um, debating maritime de re decarbonization in Glasgow for a global shipping concern uh, in earlier this year, I asked all the assembled people, are any of your regularly scheduled short sea routes longer than 1200 nautical miles? And none of them are, right? All the regularly scheduled shipping that isn't crossing oceans, it's all shorter than that. So we've, you know, by 2035 or so, we'll have battery energy density completely sufficient for all of this. That only leaves um, the need for liquid fuels goes down a lot, obviously, because it's basically it's the deep water shipping. Um, and that's going down because it's we're getting rid of all these bulks. In the end, we're going to be requiring about 70 million tons of biodiesel. And that's 70 million tons of biodiesel. Well, guess what? Right now, we actually manufacture about 70 million tons of biodiesel. Most of the biofuels we manufacture today are biodiesel. We're also manufacturing millions of tons of biofuels for aviation, which I'll get a bit to, more to. And then a bunch of bioethanol. And we're wasting that all on ground transport, or a lot of it on ground transportation. We're going to stop doing that. We're making a lot of it from primary agricultural crops and palm, palm trees. We're going to stop doing that. And we're going to start making biofuels from our waste biomass streams. Uh, if you, you know, start wondering how much it takes for, you know, anybody who's got a calculator or a spreadsheet open, uh, a 
ton of biofuel requires 2.5 tons of dried biomass, right? So 2.5 down to one, down to 10, down to one. And if we need a couple of hundred million tons, you know, 70 for maritime shipping, you know, another 130 say for aviation, well, then that's going to require 500 million tons of dry biomass. Well, our global food waste is 2.5 billion tons. And just European livestock dung is 1.5 billion ton, dung, tons. And our timber waste is up in the billions as well. We've got lots of waste biomass. And it's a problem right now because waste biomass gets dumped into landfills or middens where it sits in big piles. And then part of it decomposes into methane, which is a really high global warming potential gas. A big part of our global warming problem is bio anthropogenic biomethane. It's actually, according to the uh, Global Institute, which tracks this and does reports every year, a bigger problem than all the methane from fossil fuel leaking, which is a lot. Now, this is before the... Um, you know, recent discovery that the fossil fuel industry had been significantly under-reporting their methane leaking. So I don't have um, completely up-to-date numbers on that, but it's, you know, it's an interesting thing. Um, and so we've got to fix that. Turning those waste, that waste biomass into biofuels makes a tremendous amount of sense. And it's not rocket science. It can be done. So liquid fuels will be biodiesel. We'll only need that for the longest uh, haul shipping. And that's going to work. Now, most of those ships will actually also be hybrid biofuel and battery ships because once you cross the um, international uh, you know, uh, border in the sea, then they'll probably switch to batteries to avoid any pollution in you know, coastal waters and ports, avoid noise pollution in ports. And they'll run, instead of running generators for auxiliary power, they'll plug into um, electricity from the shore or they'll run off their batteries for you know, all their normal maintenance stuff. It's not rocket science. They'll, they'll optimize for as much electricity as possible and minimize the biofuel consumption, just like hybrid um, planes and everything else does today. Okay, that's really good news. There's a good news story there, by the way. This is just with these levers, the CO2 emissions for global shipping. You know, that's a curve that's actually pretty good. When I shared this with the people in Glasgow, I said, you know, if you get ahead of the curve, you can see true zero, not net zero, no offsets from 2050. And if you're aggressive about it, you can get there before then. This isn't hard to do. It just takes time and effort. So what about aviation, another hard target? Well, this is um, a regional air mobility maturation scenario I put together. What's regional air mobility? Well, right now we run on hub and spoke. We've got these big jets with very big engines, which are miracles of modern technology. They're about 50% efficient. When they're running at 38,000 feet at optimal cruising speed. If they're not at that, if they're like on the runway, it's like pouring kerosene on the runway. Um, but they only use about 80 airports in North America. You know, that's 90% of our passenger travel goes through a very small number of hub and spoke airports. Well, regional air mobility says, well, when we have electric airplanes, their maintenance costs and operation costs are going to be a lot lower. Capital costs is going to be higher for a while. The operation costs, so we can fly into and activate the 5,000 plus regional commercial airports in North America and the 3,000 in Europe and the many other thousands around the world. A smaller, we're gonna start with small electric planes. You know, Flymax is, you know, the firm that I'm on the advisory board of is an electric plane startup. Um, and as we move forward, we're gonna run into some roadblocks, some things which prevent us from really having a lot of them flying around. And these, by the way, are conventional winged planes None of these origami electric VTOL things. Those things are nonsense. If anybody's got any you know, money into any of those stocks, get it out now because or you've probably already lost it anyway because they've all plummeted in value as people realize there's no business case there. But there's still a pilot challenge. Um, we are, have a shortage of pilots after COVID. Um, and a lot of small planes, a lot more small commercial planes flying around don't help with that. 
Well, that's where people like X-Wing come in who are doing autonomous cargo planes. They're taking standard small cargo planes. They're flying them from small airports with a pilot observer, just like the old autonomous car people used to have the, pilot, the driver observer, a pilot observer in the cockpit, but the actual plane is flying by itself. It's actually easier to have an autonomous plane than an autonomous car. There are no children on bicycles at 30,000 feet or 10,000 feet. You know, there's no deer jumping out of the bushes at you. There's no uh, black ice. It's quite remarkably much um, uh, easier to fly autonomously than to drive around in our city streets. So the autonomous flying is improving and that's going to get there. That's mostly a regulatory approval concern now. You know, and that regulatory stuff takes a while. So that's why the maturation will take a while. Um, but the second thing that's going to have to happen is we have to get rid of the pilots. Getting rid of the pilots means that everything in the air has to manage to be able to control with a, a digital air traffic control, have a digital transponder, have a identifier, share, get instructions from the computer. And human pilots are going to be overseeing the system, saying approving stuff, or people on the ground are going to be approving that for the things they, they have in the air. The way that X Wing does it, they have a little control center down on the ground. They actually have a radio link um, to the plane. And when the um, air traffic controller talks to the plane, that goes to the ground control and the ground control talks through the aircraft radio to the uh, air traffic controller. It's a bit Rube Goldberg, works for now, but we don't need that in the future. So that's gonna take a while. Most of that is regulatory. And the same thing for marine shipping applies for, in terms of battery and energy density improvements applies for this. We're going to get by about 2040 silicon um, battery technologies, three of which are two of which are commercialized and the third, of which is um, in TRL level nine lab uh, statements. Those have the um, theoretical potential energy density to fly 100 people, 3000 kilometers, which is to say the distance between Ireland and Gander, Newfoundland. Um, you know, so that is going to expand. The way I project it is that um, pretty much um, all of uh, continent in within continent aviation is going to become battery electric, and only transoceanic aviation is going to require a new chemistry beyond silicon, which I don't know what it is, but I'm I, I know enough electric electrochemistry because I was also in the advisory of uh, battery electrochemistry board to know that we're we have a lot of stuff that we have we can unlock with these technologies. So recovery from COVID is not gonna be um, as, as strong. I'll just say that right now. You know, that's simply because 20% of passenger travel was business travel. And this is an example of something, you know, what we're doing right now is an example of something that is not something that we would have done five, 10 years ago, nearly as much. Now we are all used to doing business deals. We were doing billion dollar business deals over Zoom a couple of years ago. No, we didn't have to fly because we weren't allowed to fly. And we discovered we didn't have to fly. And we discovered a lot of us discovered it's really nice not to have to fly. Um, the secondary part there though, a lot of that business travel were consultants, people who had to go to a physical location because the um, people who were paying them wanted to see them, but they didn't want to pay for the travel. Well, now people are running with hybrid work things and half the time, the people um, that the client consultant would have to work with in the client site, well, they're working from home anyway. So why would the consultant go there? And why would the client pay me for them to go there? So the, well, there's a, a bit of a rebound um, due to everybody wanting to just get out of their homes, their get to Cancun or wherever, that's flattening out again. But the business travel didn't come back nearly as much. Um, nobody wants to pay for that. And a lot of people don't want to do it. They're doing it through Zoom again. So then we get into, you know, Jet A, kerosene. That's declining. You know, it's going to have a long tail. We're going to have a lot of places in, you know, the middle of nowhere that still are burning some Jet A uh, out in the future. Um, SAF biofuels, basically sustainable aviation fuels that are made from biofuels, made from you know, ethanol to kerosene or food waste through fermentation to et cetera. There's multiple pathways. I've done the 
there's about 10 different biomass and technology pathways to kerosene and diesel, which are completely fit for purpose. And uh, bio biomass, uh, biofuel kerosene and biofuel diesel actually burn cleaner. We'll just be burning a lot, a lot less of them. Um, so that's good news, right? Once again, that has an implication. Oh, CO2 emissions. So here's our CO2 emissions. That's the big one. And that's the, as we get out to 2050 and 2060, one of the interesting things that occurs here is that biofuels, actually, even if we take them from crops, which is the assumption here, it's not necessary, but we can take stock cellulosic pathways where we take, instead of the um, head of corn, the stock of corn, take the stock, mulch it, put it through lignin fermentation processes, make ethanol, upgrade that to biodiesel or biokerosene. Even if we're using agriculture, um, which we have enough of with stock cellulosic to get us to biofuels, well, we're going to be decarbonizing uh, uh, agriculture in the same pathway. We're going to be using you know, green hydrogen to make ammonia. We're going to be using less ammonia because we're going to be um, using precision agriculture, all those types of things. But in actual fact, this carbon curve is even better than that because the waste biomass turns into methane. We divert that, capture it, prevent the methane emissions. So our, avi our sustainable aviation fuels will actually be negative carbon. It'll be pretty interesting. And then there's the contrails. Those are avoidable. They, only, they don't exist with, with electric planes at all. But even for planes with jet engines burning biofuels, we're starting to figure out what it takes to avoid manufacturing contrails, which are about a third of the global warming problem with aviation. So great news there. What does this all turn into? Well, one of the big fuss points that people make is, what about all those metals? What about all that massive amounts of mining? So this is a context slide. We've got 20 billion tons of coal, oil, and gas that we extract process, refine, distribute, and mostly burn once. We're extracting 20 billion uh, um, tons of stuff to burn once for the most part. Um, let's compare like uh, iron, that's 2.6 billion tons and it's permanent. Once we've made a ton of uh, steel, we can recycle that. And here's, look down here, these are the industrial metals these tiny little stacks down here, we're down into the millions or million of tons of uh, you know, metals required for lithium, for other things. Um, we have to move a lot of rock to get them, but once we have them, instead of extracting them and burning them, we extract them and put them into a battery. Let's pretend a Tesla has a, an 80 kilograms of lithium in its battery, um, just pretend. Uh, that 80 kilograms, well, it gets charged and charged and charged and maybe lasts 10 years. You got to you reuse it. 10 years, you just add electrons, remove electrons, add electrons, remove electrons. Eventually it gets to end of life, the car gets to end of life. Well, maybe the battery pack gets taken out, gets put behind the meter as behind the meter storage or gets put in front of the meter on as grid storage. Lots of people were working on that. Lots of stuff going on all over the world around battery reuse and battery recycling. Um, and while my watch, my little Apple watch, the lithium ion battery is kind of tough to recycle because it's so tiny, a car's battery pack is worth mining. So as we get into much larger scale batteries for ships, planes, trucks, et cetera, we will be extracting all those metals from them. And we'll be building the battery packs to make that viable. So 10 years of primary life, tons of use, then another five to 10 years of secondary use, then recycling into more batteries. And it's just gonna be a vastly more efficient thing. So that's the, you know, the recycling thing. But then there's the other thing is, what about cobalt? You know, what about copper? Well, that's the material substitution. The nice thing about metals is we can use different metals for different purposes just fine. Let's take high voltage direct current cables. Those are the big ones that go subsea. If you've heard about the x -Links project that takes, is gonna take um, uh, wind, solar, uh, from electricity from Morocco up to the UK. Well, that's an HVDC cable that goes underground. The one that's going down into New York state from Canada right now, that's an HVDC cable, direct current. Uh, and 
most of the ones for subsea and a lot of the ones overland are made of aluminum. It's lighter. Um, when you've got 3,000 uh, kilometers of cable you want to bury under the, in a trench under the sea, you want that cable to be as light as possible. So we can use aluminum for that, not copper. Similarly, there's lots of battery chemistries out there now that don't use any cobalt at all or use you know, a hundredth of the cobalt that we had before. And right now is a big minerals boom, which is great for Canada because we have a lot of hard rock mining and we've got a lot of hard rock mining experience to go and find these things. For lithium, we've got all sorts of interesting things where, for example, in Alberta, there's a startup that I've, uh, I'm aware of that actually is doing unconventional lithium extraction. What it does is it digs down, uh, drills down to a lithium brine, uh, salt brine bubble underground in, you know, most oil uh, regions have these salt brines, and it extracts the brine, puts it through a reverse osmotic filter, takes the lithium out, and pumps the rest of the stuff back down. So you can actually get, um, you know, good amounts of lithium out. This is exactly the same process as they use in Chile in the high desert, except in, instead of pumping it up and let it dry in pools and letting the sun do it, just push it through a reverse osmotic filter, a lot like um, uh, desalinating water same kind of process. So that's where it's going to work, right? We've got all these metals are going to be a vastly smaller amount. Um, we're not going to be extracting 20 billion tons of uh, hydrocarbons every year. We may be extracting, you know, a billion, you know, a few billion tons because, you know, we're, they're still very valuable feedstock. We just won't be burning them. And we're going to be continuing to find cool new ways to make batteries with higher energy densities. So it's all gonna be much better. Um, that's my prepared talk. So now let's uh, switch over and turn it to q and I'm going to bring uh, Jason on to uh, go through some of the questions. Before I do that, I'm just curious, Michael, you mentioned um, <clears throat> the lithium extraction. Is that a Mandal that you're referring to and that company, uh, Critical Materials, I think it's called? Nope, that's a different nope. one. Okay, I know that she's been, uh, her company developed uh, some technology to allow uh, lithium extraction from basically uh, abandoned oil wells. And mm -hmm. uh, But I think a lot of work's going on, as you said, in Bolivia. I don't know that it's practical yet for the Canadian uh, Canadian landscape. Yeah, well, we've got at least one company op um, operating. I don't know if they're, um, I don't know if Alberta pulled their plug uh, uh, along with everybody else, you know, recently this year. I haven't checked up, but we'll yeah. find out. Okay, no, thank. All right, hey, Jason. Good evening. We'll start with uh, a popular one. Can you expand on why hydrogen is so mind-bogglingly stupid, yet gets so much press and hype? Uh, sure. Um, you know, the, uh, let, let's start with why it's mind-bogglingly stupid. Uh, you know, basically, the at best case scenario, every study has done this, and the uh, APM terminal study has found this, Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are more capital expensive, and hydrogen itself as a fuel is always going to be more expensive than electrons. So the truck or car or whatever uh, is more expensive to buy, and then it's more expensive to fuel as well. No fleet manager or sane person in the world will buy hydrogen vehicles if there are battery electric vehicles available, and there's virtually always battery electric vehicles available. Uh, IKEA made headlines recently in Austria because they bought five hydrogen trucks. Well, those five hydrogen trucks, the state of Austria gave them 4.8 million euros, almost a million euros per truck to set those up. You know, unless the government gives you a lot of money, not gonna happen. So why? Well, thing one, um, if um, hydrogen becomes a source of energy, a store of energy, then we can't make enough of it with electrolysis. We just simply don't have enough electricity. We've got about 120 million tons that we use every uh, year right now. We manufacture and use it almost entirely from you know, natural gas, oil, and coal. That's because they're hydrocarbons, the hydro is hydrogen. There's different ways to steam reformation and a couple of ways to get hydrogen out of them. Well, if we make hydrogen replace our fuels, and we have liquid fuels that we burn, well, then we need a lot more of them. Um, and guess what? Well, we can't do that with electrolysis. In 2019, we had just enough um, renewable electricity 
to make the 120 million tons. So all the renewable electricity we built up until 2019 was barely enough to decarbonize the hydrogen we currently use. Not a great story. Um, moving forward though, if we have to multiply the amount of hydrogen by up to replace billions of tons of fossil fuels, well, that means we're gonna have to have billions of tons of hydrogen and we can't make that with electrolysis. So what's gonna happen is the fossil fuel companies get to extract that more from their fossil fuels and get the government to pay for carbon capture and put, you know, which doesn't work in any event, supercritical CO2, which is something I was spending a lot of time looking at today. Um, and then they'll, they're, um, it will cost them, cost us more to get the uh, hydrogen. And we'll also throw away a bunch of the energy in the, in the fossil fuels. Uh, here's a fun one, natural gas. You take the carbon from natural gas, you still, and you're, you're left with four hydrogens, well, the carbon is 45% of the energy when you burn natural gas. You're only left with 55% of the energy and you spend a bunch of energy to get that. It's just stupid. Um, so the fossil fuel companies, you see why the fossil fuel companies want to do it. If they can do it, their hydrocarbon reserves are worth money. If they can't, they're not. Um, if they can convince a bunch of people to waste a bunch of time on hydrogen, they get keep getting to sell hydrocarbons. They keep getting to sell sell coal, oil, and natural gas for another decade, they delay action. They can't lose. It's the it's a, a only obvious strategy for them as long as they don't care about the climate or you know future generations. And they've proven that they don't. You know That's just basically the way it is. Uh, anybody of you who works in the fossil fuel industry, I, I'm sorry you've got a soul-destroying life. Um, you know, that is what it is. You've got to keep food on the, uh, on the plates of your family and you've got to keep a roof over your head. So I, I understand the compromises get made. But then you think about it, well, the banks that the, the fossil fuel companies work with, what happens if the hydrocarbon reserves of their clients become worth pennies in the dollar? Well, all the debt that is based upon those reserves turns into bank debt, debt that's underwater. They can't make any money there. All the investments that they've put into those places can't get there. All, all, all these bankers, they don't have STEM degrees. They're, they're not chemists and physicists. They're business majors. You know, they don't, they don't know what the answer is. They just go to the oil and gas people and say, what's the answer? And the oil and gas people tell them what they want to hear. And so the financiers believe it. And we get people like our government, you know, especially our government in the, you know, I'm just going to say the prairies, our governments in the prairies. They really want to believe that hydrogen is the answer because otherwise, well, all their um, all their revenue from governmental revenue from uh, royalties from oil and gas go away. And in Canada, you know, after you kind of like look at secondary and tertiary, that's maybe five percent of our economy disappears. Uh, and, and by the way, this is something to keep in mind for Canada: oil and gas and coal are only five percent of our economy, even after the secondary and um, stuff. We're not going to be that badly off once we stop shipping it. And Alberta's product will be first off the market with peak oil demand this decade. Uh, it's just too expensive and stuff. Now, here's a hydrogen story for you. A full third of hydrogen we manufacture today is used to de you know, to process and refine um, petroleum. And the stuff that requires the most hydrogen is heavy sour crude, tar that we get from the oil sands with high sulfur. So those things are used the most that's going to increase as we decarbonize hydrogen. That's going to make them even more expensive. They're going to be first off the market because no one's going to bother buying them. Just nutty things. So you can see how there's this cycle. The, the last thing I'll say about hydrogen is every company with hydrogen with internal combustion patents, their patents are worthless, and they're trying to delay that as long as possible. So they're making hydrogen combustion engines in the vain hope that they can convince people their intellectual capital is worth something. I've talked to people at Mann and Marcilla, Daimler's, um, you know, one of their guys on their board is pretending this is a thing. It's quite remarkable that the desperation is reeking off of these companies. Anyway, I, I think that answers the first question, which is why are we wasting time on hydrogen? Thank you. Bringing something a bit closer to home uh, why has electrified modernized passenger rail, which is by far the most efficient form of land transport, been virtually ignored in Canada 
in comparison to our federal government's decision to embrace electric vehicles. And someone also asked uh, a related question around, is this uh, especially high speed rail, is this potentially due to the limitations on our current infrastructure, our rails and ties, et cetera? Uh, so the rest of the world treats rail as highways. They aren't owned for the most part by private corporations. Uh, trucking companies don't own highways. But in North America, the way, the way that rail developed in the, eight, in the 19th century is that robber barons in the United States built a crap ton of rails and private ownership became the standard for rail companies. So we don't have nationalized um, strategic assets for transportation. We have private assets. Uh, as a result, there's kind of some things that have come up. And these are not passenger company, train companies that own these rails. These are freight rail companies that own these rails. Um, so in the rest of the world, passenger trains are prioritized so that people can get places quickly. In North America, uh, if you run on the same track as a passenger as freight, if the freight rail has to go through, the passenger train gets sidelined. Um, so we have this inversion of the pattern in the rest of the world where you know it's considered a public good and passenger travel is prioritized over freight travel inverted here we also have this interesting thing where we have because we're a big country in part um but also because of this private ownership in canada and north in north america i think there's 700 different corporations which own chunks of the rail and we have about twice the length of rail per ton of um, goods as Europe uh, as we sit there. So what this means is all these 700 people are highly resistant. They, they don't have as much revenue per mile of rail as the rest of the world sees. So they can't afford to spend as much on maintenance and they certainly can't spend as much on electrification, which is a capital intensive project. So we have this kind of barrier um, you know, what the strategy for rail really is, and Canada could do this, by the way, we could, uh, I, I propose, um, you know, you heard it here for the 14th time, if you've listened to me before, a HVDC and electrified rail corridor across Canada, right? Just, just, it's, they're both linear assets, just do it. We've got the rate of ways, just do it. Uh, it would make a lot of sense, put an HVDC drop off in every province, share renewables across the current country, share them down to the states and electrify our rail and wait for the United States to get out of its um, its nonsense. Um, but what will happen in the states is they should they're going to be going bankrupt because um, they're going to be losing the four million tons of four million cars of coal, 70,000 uh, cars of oil. They're going to be losing containers and other ships to the road electrified freight because it'll be cheaper and there'll be autonomous uh, trucks on the roads. And so rail in North America is going to see a lot of bankruptcies. There's going to be a bunch of M&A stuff. Hopefully the government will step in and sanity will prevail. We'll just be behind the rest of the world. But that's why we don't have nice things um, because of private ownership of rail. Okay, thank you. Uh, Regarding resources, there's a question about uh, what do you think about the potential of deep sea mining for providing some of these minerals and metals? Well, deep sea mining um, has a very specific set of attributes. Um, the specific set of attributes is in their, they're in a, ambiguously regulated extraterritorial zones. And mining extraction people love those because they can go in they can make a complete and utter mess extract stuff destroy the ecosystem and pretend they're allowed to and kind of get away with it so we, we see this in the a pattern for rare earths um you know and you know the rare earth mining you know ended up in ulan Bator, which was uh, on the border of china and mongolia it became an industrial site it was a questionable territorial regulation stuff you know uh rare earths are a primary example is you know, I, I recommend you read you know the the uh, 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 a book that lays this out it's fascinating stuff but this is a problem right so do we need to go undersea to mine no we don't we've got all the minerals that are available to extract on land we can do mining here we can do processing here what 
subsea mining allows us to do is ignore it and pretend that the bad stuff isn't happening. Well, guess what? The bad stuff is happening. So, you know, we should um, have an industrial policy that brings hard rock mining and rare earth mining back into the developed world. We're going to have to pay China for a bunch of uh, rare earth clean tech processing stuff because they started cleaning up rare earth processing in 2010 or so. And they're world leaders in terms of doing that with as few environmental things as possible because they screwed it up the first time and they learned their lesson and now they're doing it a lot better. Um, but we shouldn't be screwing up the pristine parts of the world um, undersea because there's the ramifications of that are very poorly understood. Hope that helps. Okay. This is tangential to electrification, but uh, one of the questions that popped into my head when you were talking about switching away from fossil fuels for shipping. What do you think about the companies that are looking at sales or sale type technologies for ocean going ships? Sure. Um, I, I've had this debate. I've uh, done analysis of Magnus effect rotors, which are the spinning rotors in the top of ships. And I've looked at uh, the parasails that are attached to the bow ships. And I've looked at the new folding rotors that Barr is putting in place that are based on America uh, cup sails. And there's a few things. One thing is all these things have to integrate with current ports. Um, shipping is not the ships in the middle of the sea. Shipping is its ports, its tugboats, its bridges, it's all those things. And so, well, everything has to work with the equipment that takes goods and services into and out of ships. And stuff that sticks up from the deck a lot is contraindicated for that. You can't put sails up through the uh, um, through the containers in a container ship, um, they're stacked five high above the deck. They're stacked like hundred feet above the deck. You, what are you going to do? Make the sail even higher than that? It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, for some classes of bulk shipping, you know, or for bulk shipping and container shipping, the parasails at the front, I you know suggest are pretty good. They probably get about ten percent savings on routes that make them. We've been doing auto furling and auto flying of parasails. Um, you know, for at least a decade, it's not hard to do. Uh, you know, airborne generation of electricity with airborne wind makes no sense, but using traction power from parasol uh, kites is actually a pretty small intervention on a ship. Now, the bar uh, thing with the sails, which rotate up and then pivot into the wind and have the complex stuff, I suspect that one's going to fail. I just don't think it makes a lot of sense, but they do at least fold them flat to the deck on bulk carriers so they get out of the way of the cranes and stuff that go into the uh, stuff. It just seems a little complex, especially when we can just burn, put them batteries and some biofuels and get better effects. I, I think it's just the wrong stuff, but that's me. Thank you. Moving over to aviation. Uh, one comment says, aviation has a history of a slow regulatory cycle. General aviation is only now getting the lead out of avgas, and there's been talk about sustainable av aviation fuel for a while, but little uptake. Do you think regulatory bodies will be a significant speed bump in mass adoption of both sustainable fuels and battery electric planes? Oh, yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, International Civil Aviation Authority is still claiming they're going to be using offsets for most of aviation's emissions, and, and that's voluntary offsets. I, I spent some time with Dr. Joseph Rahm, um, who you know has worked in the White House and worked in the department, ran billion dollar programs in the Department of Energy. Now he's working with Michael Mann at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, some of you may have read his Climate Progress blog that he maintained for over a decade. But I spoke to him recently. He, he released a paper on offsets earlier this year, voluntary offsets. Boy, are they crap. Um, you know, the voluntary offset mark is like $2 per ton of CO2, where the EU's price, which is still low, is $90 per ton or $100 per ton. And our current social cost of carbon is around $190 per ton, right? So, hmm, 1%. That's not actually paying anything. What happens is these voluntary offsets, which is what the Corsia program for aviation depends on, 
you buy big chunks of land in Nigeria of low hanging fruit. We're going to preserve this grassland. And that's cheap, right? You know, there's another deal that came out just today. It's really cheap to buy that grassland. Well, you can't double count it. So only the buying country or company can count it. But that still leaves, that means the selling country can't count it, but they still have the same amount of emissions, which means that as the price of carbon inevitably gets up to the high point, the poorest countries in the world are going to be paying $200 or $300 a ton for offsets with money they don't have. No, there's the entire thing is a shell game and it's going to collapse. Um, there's a whole bunch of movement around this um, and stuff. So that's ICAO. They're depending upon that. Now, what's happening in reality, though, is the EU is starting to price aviation fuel for carbon emissions. Um, that's actually going to increase the cost of aviation fuel quite substantially and bring those into into um, into alignment. Uh, they're actually removing the um, a lot of the stuff from marine shipping as well. So same thing. And the interesting thing there is their carbon border adjustment mechanism, which goes live fully in 2026, will start pricing that carbon on scope one and scope two emissions in North America, China, or anywhere else. So a product, if it has any fossil fuels in its value stream, will be priced and it's exported to Europe, will be priced for that carbon at the EU's price of carbon. Now, next thing on the price of carbon, We've got our social price of carbon in Canada. It's uh, $261 Canadian right now, about 190 Canadian or 190 US. Um, the United States, the, e uh, the EPA has their social cost of, cost of carbon and Canada and the United States have aligned our social cost of carbon calculations. The uh, EPA two years ago said it should be 190 bucks in Canada's social cost of carbon is there. Obviously, our carbon price, which just went through its little kerfuffle, little tempest in a teapot, um, is well below that, but it's going to increase. The EU's recommended um, budgetary guidance for infrastructure projects and everything else is aligned with the social cost of carbon year over year. That turns into 300 US a ton in 2040, right? And once again, those offsets are down here like two or three bucks you know so the, the, the voluntary ones are meaningless but the eu's that's actually a monitored mandated thing that's going to be pricing aviation fuel and so that's going to make the difference that's going to make um biofuels cost competitive it won't make hydrogen or synthetic fuels cost cost competitive but it'll also put a lot of wings beneath, beneath the wings of um batteries as well uh, i hope that answers your question Thank you. One last one and then back to Tim. Uh, Go Transit electrification and LRTs are being implemented using overhead wires on rails. 100 year old technology, high cost, susceptible to weather and damage. What's needed to get government and industry on board with battery electric technology that can be implemented and constructed? at a fraction of those costs. Okay, so let's tear apart some mis, mis, uh, uh, some, mis mis some inappropriate uh, statements in there. Uh, overhead wires are completely fit for purpose and they're not expensive. They're actually the cheapest way to electrify rail, um, unless you go over a bridge or through a tunnel where they're not appropriate. Um, you know, so what you want to do is you want to electrify with overhead catenary lines everything you can cheaply, and then have a battery in a container on the train or whatever to get you over bridges and through tunnels. Um, you know, uh, Baden-Württemberger in the you know in Germany did this study and they said uh, hybrid overhead. Uh, so if you can do uh, uh, overhead wires, it's cheapest. And everybody finds this. So that's not expensive. It's completely fit for purpose. Um, but battery electric with um, that, well, the catenary overhead with batteries to bridge bridges and tunnels is just slightly cheaper for those additional ones. What UK is doing, for example, is they're actually putting those overhead wires through tunnels and over bridges. And that's why it's three times more expensive for their system 
than it is per kilometer just along the ground. So there's a real weirdness about this um, overhead wires. They're, they're the right solution. Um, the batteries have a part in the solution as well. And how do we do it? Well, we just keep saying, hey, guys, if you electrify this for that bit, just put a battery in. You'll save a lot of money. Just keep pointing out the cost thing. Um, you know, and uh, does that mean the, that Metrolinx and will be, or that um, is it Metrolinx in Ontario? I keep forgetting which which one is which. Anyway, the, the Go Transit people um, doesn't mean they'll do the right thing, but maybe they will. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, yes, that, that was terrific. Really terrific. We don't uh, often, you know, think much about the bigger uh, transport issue and electrification and, and you really put a, a lens over it for us today. So thanks for that. And I know we, we've talked uh, prior to this uh, meeting today about some other topics and, and I hope I can hold you to it to uh, perhaps bring you back on another occasion and we'll tackle a, a totally different topic. You're, you're very, very well versed. So we, we appreciate your time. Yeah, I have opinions on a lot of stuff and some of them are even right. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, I thank you very much. And I and I also want to thank Jason for uh, wading through all the questions for us tonight. And uh, I often forget to do it. But I, I should also recognize the work that goes into this webinar done by Chris Guernsey, Anita Sharifi, and James McCallum. We, uh, we do it as a team and uh, everybody uh, does a great job for EV Society. Um, Next month, so next month's episode of Canada Talks Electric Cars, we're going to welcome back one of our favorite uh, electric vehicle technicians, uh, Dave Giles. Does a lot of work uh, on, on EVs mechanically. Dave will discuss uh, how the transition to EV changing Canada's educational system and how it's preparing the next ge generation of technici ne technicians to work on electric uh, vehicles. So remember to mark that date. It's uh, Tuesday, December the 5th at 7.30 Eastern Time. On behalf of uh, all of us here at EVS, thanks for joining us on this episode and for your continued support of the monthly webinar. Uh, from all of us at Electric Vehicle Society, and until next time, stay well. <laughs>